I'm oiling my cutting board, but it thinks it's getting a massage. See, mmm, look how smooth it is. I made this myself. It's a um, maple. It's a giant cutting board, see? Because you know from practical experience that those little teeny weeny cutting boards, you can't even cut a green onion and you're all over the counter. They're just not big enough. This is big enough, I'll say. I don't actually even like vegetables, but <laughs> I'll cut donuts on this and lots of them. This is maple and it's glorious and it's actually really easy to make. So isn't that cool? I'm gonna put that right over here. I've oiled both sides of it, although I'm re-oiling the top just be oops, because it's so good for it. Anyway, it's really fun to make a cutting board and it's basic, you know, it's basic and it makes an excellent present. So I got a few of these on the go right now. And you sort your maple though at the very beginning. It's important to sort it because some of it has knots in it like this one right here. And that stuff just does not cooperate when you're trying to get a smooth finish. So you have to kind of turn those boards upside down so that you won't actually run into them. Oh, and now look at the little problem it has. See how bowed it is? So it's important to line all the bowed boards up in the same direction. Okay, so once you have all the boards more or less lined up, you'll save yourself hours of heartache if you just set the boards up right before you start gluing them together. Because it, it's a lot of trouble to get that sur surface smooth. Looks great when it's done, but it takes a lot of sanding. Okay, so once you have them all sorted, number them because you're going to be gluing them together and you don't want to lose the, the way that they're organized. It seems a little finicky, but it really helps. Okay, so I'll number those. This is the first clump of five that I'm going to work on. And why a clump of five? Why not just glue all the boards at once because it takes too long and the glue starts to dry and then the boards don't stick together. In fact, the glue holds the boards apart because it's already gone a bit crusty and skinned over. So, therefore, I'm only going to work with five boards at once and I'm going to do five clumps of five. So, I'm ready to go now with these five. I get my glue and a putty knife. Now, this is kind of a crummy surface for gluing on because it's very porous. You have a sheet of melamine you can put down. It really helps because just nothing sticks to melamine. So you open your boards up one at a time and just slather a, la a length of glue on them. And then wipe it down with a putty knife and that's, that spreads it. I used to do the old finger technique, but that gets tiresome. See how nice that is? Just spreads it evenly. Okay, so that one's done. Then I move on to the next one. I probably should have numbered these boards. It really helps to number them. Ah, oh. Okay, I've got glue up to my elbows and I've only done four, five boards. Okay, so this goes Oh, they're starting to stick down to the surface. Now this is a bar clamp situation. You buy the bars, the pipes rather, and then you just buy these little ends. And they're great because they actually hold the board up for you like this. Okay, so you guys, I don't want to actually make contact with them till I'm ready to clamp because they tend to kind of get stuck in the wrong positions and then the glue gets torn up. Ooh, it's starting to set up all right. And finally, number five. Okay, now I'm going to push them together. I'm going to be eventually trimming the ends off so you don't have to worry too much about getting them square right now. Okay, and then wipe your hands off and tighten these down. So I'm going to do uh, four more sets of five. And the glue has to set up for 20 minutes. So once it's been in there for 20 minutes, I can... Oh, it's not great. I love that. I love that. It's one of my favorite moments in life, really, when you s squeeze a bunch of boards and the glue squirts out. Oh, see, see how fast it sets up? Like that board doesn't. Oh, there, I got it to move. Okay, so watch. Squeeze. So, four more sets of five boards, letting them set up for 20 minutes in between. 
And then I'm ready to glue all five of the five clumps together. And then I've got my cutting board, except there's going to be a whole bunch of sanding and planing and good stuff. OK, walk away. <sighs> Author Ross Laird says that sharpening is among the most meditative acts we can perform with our hands. But I think we have to assume that he meant to add, if you're doing it correctly. Because if you're not, it makes you sweaty and irritable, which kind of sours the whole meditative aspect. Okay, these babies are glued. The five clumps of five are glued. I got 25 boards here, and I used my big bar clamps because they have the most uh, torque. You know, you can really, well, it's not really torque. It's just pressure. So here's the deal. I'm going to take this out, and I'm just going to use, even before I do that, a, a putty knife, the same one that I glued with, to scrape off the excess glue because it's after about 20 minutes, you can really work with it easily, but I should have done that on all these clumps as I was gluing them instead of just wandering around thinking I had idle time. Because now the glue is so set up in spots, see, it's just really, really hard on the old stuff, so I can't get it off easily. But these new runs, I can. It just kind of curls up and peels out, which is nice when it's still soft. So the next step is, since this is a rather rugged surface, is to get this down so that you'll feel like you want to cut things on it. And there's a bunch of ways to do that. The one way that you can use if you're needing to rationalize a new tool purchase is you say, well, if I had a belt sander, I could make uh, presents for people. Everybody would get a cutting board, and uh, the tool would pay for itself in no time. So that's one way to get yourself one of these babies. And uh, it's, it's just the belt goes around, and it takes off vast amounts of material. Only thing is, it does tend to heat the glue up and melt it again. So it gets, the glue gets gummy, and it takes a while. But I'll just show you. I've got a 40 grit belt on here, which is like big chunks of gravel. So it's really aggressive. Watch. over and over this spot where the glue is and it just it's just getting soft and kind of a bit gummy even though it's been dry for ages so the other option you have is using a plane uh, you probably have a hand plane kicking around somewhere I had my dad's old one kicking around but I just got some new ones and I'm very proud and Here's the deal with planes. They're all different sizes. There are jack planes, block planes, rabbit planes, jointer planes. There's even little finger planes that instrument makers, violin makers, you just wear it on the tiny little thing you wear on the end of your finger to sculpt out little curvy bits. So here's my, so I can't ever remember the names. I wouldn't know a bench plane from a smoothing plane. I just forget, so I just name them. They've all got a name. Okay, this is Gord. He's new. He's really new. Look, he's still got the slime on him, just like a new baby. And I'll just wrap him up in a towel and, and put him in the little thing, and he'll wait to get sharpened, because they're never sharp enough. That's one thing to know. You never have a sharp tool when you've bought a brand new plane. This is a really old plane. This plane has been sharpened. It's actually sharper than the new one. That's ironic. And always store them on their sides, because that way you won't that bumped the blade, which you laboriously sharpened, which I'll show you how to do. So I'm going to start with the biggest plane I have. This is a jointer plane. The bigger the plane, the smoother, you know, the longer the plate, the smoother the cut is going to be. If you have a little wee plane, it's going to rock and roll over that, um, all those uneven boards. This baby just sits on there and just goes straight across. First, I want to get these clamps off, though, because I need to clamp the board down, otherwise it's going to walk around on me. So. Just unscrew them and move them aside. Now, you might think you only have to do the top of this thing, but you actually have to do both sides, you know, because the bottom is going to rock and roll on you if you don't. So you have to get rid of the humps and bumps on both sides. So ugh, it's heavy. All right, so I'll just clamp that down, and I'm ready to get started. And you'll have to move the clamps right at the end, because you have to get at the edges. And you need to assume 
the princess warrior position in order to use the plane properly because you really need to ground yourself well. And you just take a smooth pass from one side to the other on a bit of a diagonal. And put more pressure on it at the, at the beginning, at, on the front, and then you shift your weight to the back. So it's kind of like zoop, zoop, only more exaggerated because it's like this. Okay. Get a glue spot there. Okay, like that. And then see, it makes these beautiful curly cues that you can use for potpourri later. <sighs> okay, that's gonna take a while. Okay, this is going a lot more smoothly now. And you can see that's because it's smoother. A lot of the ridges have come out of it. It's starting to feel finer on the surface. And I have to say, this giant plane is a huge ple pleasure to use. It just floats along, and so the surface is pretty regular. But most people don't have a huge giant plane like Bernice, so they've got probably something more like, well, Harold, right? A modest plane. And they work just the same. They tend to uh, rock and roll a little bit over the, see it's a little bit, see what it's doing. It's tending to go like that a bit more. It responds more to the fluctuations in the surface. Now, I just want you to know, look, here's a couple of blades I got out. This is Gord's blade, and this is my dad's old plane blade. It was really hacked up, but look how shiny I was able to get it. And this. I have to work this surface up too so that it's just as shiny. Both the back and the front need to be shiny and that's because these things come from the factory with grinder marks all over them. So you just have to, you have to get those out. And it, I have to say, it takes ages and it's really tedious. But here's a couple of tips. This little thing you buy at a, a woodworker specialty store and it just keeps the blade on the right angle. So you don't have to think about it. You just mindlessly go back and forth like this for hours. So nice. You'll think important thoughts. And so you get one of these, you get an 800 grit Japanese water stone, which you use, it's, you know, reversible. And you keep it wet because the, the water floats away the metal particles. And so they don't just get stuck and sludgy in the actual stone and then it stops doing its job. And um, the other thing that you want to, to know is that once you're done with the 800 grit, you move to more like, I think this is a 1200 grit or something. It's really fine, and that puts the mirror finish on it. And then once you've done that, you get a, an old chunk of leather and you st staple it to a board, and this gives you what's known as a leather strop. I bet you're just thinking, I I'm never buying a plane here. It's too much trouble. But look, two hours investment of your time, and you've got a plane that you'll never really have to sharpen much. You get this um, sharpening compound, honing compound. It's this kind of green stuff. And it's a bit, of, it's just a very mild abrasive. And so then you sharpen the blade like that. It, you hone it really. So every couple of hours of, of using your plane, you should hone it like this. And it kind of pulls the molecules into a nice sharp point again. It kind of drags them, if you think of it microscopically. Okay, so that's sharpening. They should have a sharpening channel. I mean, people should watch sharpening. It's fascinating. Just a guy standing there going like this for a couple of hours. I could watch that all day. Why hasn't anybody thought of that? I don't know. So I'm going to keep going on my cutting board surface with the little plane and just take it down a little bit, try to get all the glue off, and then I'll start sanding. <laughs> I like to choose one special day out of every year just to put an edge on all my tools till they're so sharp they can slice paper. Now that's a day to take the phone off the hook because sharpening is the kind of fun that shouldn't be interrupted by anyone or anything. Okay, so. I'm just cutting off the edges because they were a big mess. And I'm going to now move into the belt sanding area. <coughs> there. Just a little fur ball, really. Uh, mixed with sand, whatever that stuff is called, <laughs> sawdust. Whew. 
Okay, possibly a good idea to wear a mask sometimes when you're working with wood. So I've cut off the ends to make this nice and flush. And I am now at the point where I'm going to begin to belt sand the surface. Now, a word about sanding. Okay, this is the critical tip you've got to know, even if you've never sanded before in your life. And boy, are you in for a treat. I wanted to show you this. Look, see this pit here? This is the low point, the low point on my board, along with that one. I'm going to have to sand to the bottom of that pit. If I don't sand to the bottom of that pit, thinking, oh, I'll just get that later with, with you know, like, this is the heavy duty sandpaper. I'll, if I just think I'll get that later with a finer sandpaper, I am kidding myself. Because the little grains will be trying to get to the bottom of the pit, but they can't reach it because they're little. So use the big grains to get to the bottom of the pit. Okay. So off we go. Sometimes when you're doing something repetitive, you just have to jack up the excitement level with a power tool. You instantly feel perkier and more glamorous, but you still have to do the job properly, and that can, as always, be elusive. Okay, you, you could watch me sand for hours probably because it's very interesting. But here's the highlights, all right? I'm going on a bit of a diagonal to start with because go, sanding across the grain takes off a bit more material and I want to be quite aggressive at this point because I got a long way to go to get down to the bottom of my pits. And then I'm going to change the direction, okay? I, I don't want to just keep going on a diagonal because I'll end up with all these scratches that run in this, this kind of diagonal. So I have to then switch to going straight with this nice heavy 40 grit belt. Then, when it's all smooth, no pits, and everything's lined up, I take this belt off simply by squeezing this. Little, the little assembly squeezes together, so it loosens the belt. I'll change the belt to a 60 grit, to an 80 grit, to a 100 grit, to a 120 grit. Go say 100, okay, 100. To 180, then 220, then all the way up probably to 600 till this thing is so smooth that you could drag a pair of pantyhose across the surface and it wouldn't even catch. That's my goal. Also, I'm going to round these corners off because, you know, the, the prototype has those soft, smooth corners. And I'm going to do that not with a belt sander, but with an orbital sander, which spins around. And I'll just soften all these edges so that it's nice to use. And then when you bump into it, you don't have big slash hip bruises all over yourself just from using your own creation. All right, so I'm ready to go again. I couldn't find any pantyhose for the pantyhose test, so I used silk long johns, but they work great. See, they weren't catching. That's because it's smooth. So, so sensual. So now I have to put a little oil on it. You've got to seal it right away or it starts to cup and twist and warp and dance. So I'll be doing that. But first I wanted to show you some stuff that some other people did because they're laminating professionals. Okay. Ted Cordner made a cutting board for his son and his daughter-in-law. It's well used and well loved. He did a router thing, so he made the, uh, for the dripping sauces t to fall into. Also, just behind Ted's work is Jim Lorimer's work. Now, he is a wood turner. He likes to put stuff on a lathe and turn it. So this, all these bowls are his, and he laminates the wood together. See, look, he put a whole bunch of uh, bird's eye maple pieces together. Don't they look like water drops in a lake? It's beautiful. And he could never have gotten that with a single piece of wood. He likes to use up, you know, recycle everything. Here you can see it really clearly. He's put together kind of a cube of wood. And then, you know, you can see it's just individual boards. It's so pretty. And then this one is mountain rising. See how you can see the beautiful lines? And see laminated pieces of wood. This is so much fun to work with hardwood because it's got such personality and you can find lines and, and beauty in it no matter what you do with it. So even if your cutting board doesn't turn out to be absolutely perfect, you still know that it's beautiful in its own heart because of course it came from the woods. So this is the oil I'm going to just 
slime on and I'll leave it to sit in puddles. I'll spread it around a bit and then wipe it off. And it's just mineral oil, which you can buy at the drugstore or wherever. Only kind of oil you should finish a cutting surface with is mineral oil or a special oil made for blocks and salad bowls. So pretty. See how the color comes out? La -de la. It's hard to understand how using your hands to sharpen stuff can be fun until you've tried it. But the moment you finally achieve bona fide paper slicing sharpness, you have a corporeal epiphany. And that's one of the best reasons I know for cultivating the reputation of being good with your hands. <laughs>